Hi, my name is Abby Gay. I beat the awesome path by leveraging the voices of marginalized communities. Today, we're going to talk about education. Who has it? Who wants it? What is it? And more importantly, how can you build a life and career for yourself if education is something that you're passionate about? Today's episode on education is brought to you by Joe's Seafood, home of the original Squid Game. Guess how long the squid's been out of the refrigerator? Then take a bite. Squid Game, only at Joe's Seafood. But the big question in all of this is, why should you care about education? After all, all of us graduated from Harvard after Daddy Dearest built a new billiards wing in the library. But in all seriousness, if education is a problem that you want to solve, like my guest today, Robbie Gay did, founder of Teach for Senegal, there's never been a better time to get into it. But first, why should you give a shit? Why should you give a shit? Deep in your heart, I'm sure you realize that as a result of poverty and marginalization, more than 72 million children around the world remain unschooled, according to an article on humanium.org at least. And while that number might sound low at first glance, it can be a little misleading. UNICEF indicates that a lack of trained teachers, inadequate learning materials, makeshift classes, and poor sanitation facilities make learning difficult for many children. Others come to school too hungry, sick, or exhausted from work or household tasks to benefit from their lessons. And then you say, well, how bad could it be? It's not too terrible, right? Only an estimated 617 million children and adolescents around the world are unable to reach minimum proficiency levels in reading and mathematics, even though two-thirds of them are in school. As I can confirm from extensive personal experience, simply being in school does not mean one is learning. Piggybacking on this, World Bank says, worldwide, hundreds of millions of children reach young adulthood without even the most basic skills, like calculating the correct change from a transaction, reading a doctor's instructions, or understanding a bus schedule, let alone building a fulfilling career or educating their children. And unfortunately, gender plays a role in this as well. When some families need to spend up to 40% of their income on non-negotiable school expenses, like school uniforms, for example, they might choose to send only the boys to school, leaving the girls at home. Santa Momtani writes, there are still no sub-Saharan African countries where an equal number of boys and girls attend primary and secondary school. There are only 92 girls in the region for every 100 boys in primary school. In short, in many places, families are forced to consider schooling in some form or another a luxury rather than a necessity, an issue outlined by my earlier podcast guest, Babur Ali, the youngest headmaster in the world. Of course, the great irony in all of this is that the cost of educating children is far outweighed by the cost of not educating them. Adults who lack basic skills have greater difficulty finding well-paying jobs and escaping poverty. Education for girls has particularly striking social benefits. Incomes are higher and maternal and infant mortality rates are lower for educated women who also have more personal freedom in making choices. Now that's from a piece written by Arya L. Hillman and Eva Jenkner, I'm butchering their names, I'm sure. And it's not like these problems are entirely limited to poverty-stricken countries. Even in the US, the pandemic highlighted that remote access schooling affected marginalized groups disproportionately. Human Rights Watch says, in many countries, the heavy reliance on online learning and connectivity technologies to deliver education exacerbated learning inequalities because many governments did not have the policies, resources, or infrastructure to roll out online learning in a fully inclusive manner. So we know that education is pretty broken right now around the world and certainly in countries that were struggling before the pandemic, but also in the US. And there's hope here, and that's what I want to talk about today. That's the focus of this episode. According to the UN, the new analysis by UNESCO's Global Education Monitoring, GEM, report team shows that nearly 60 million people could escape poverty if all adults had just two more years of schooling. And what's even crazier, if all adults completed secondary education, 420 million could be lifted out of poverty, reducing the total number of poor people by more than half globally and by almost two thirds in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, <laughs> 420. That's according to UNESCO. But to do that, someone has to make it their mission to begin solving these issues. And that someone could be you. So let's meet Robbie Gay, who came to the US as a refugee from Senegal and then chose to go back to Senegal to start Teach for Senegal, finding a mission and personal joy along the way. So here are some highlights from my chat with Robbie Gay. 
So I'm so glad to have you. Thank you very much for joining me today. I can't wait to hear your story. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, technical difficulties, but that's that's what happens when you work in <laughs> rural communities sometimes. That's right. We've had it before, and that's what happens when you're doing this via Zoom. But the benefit yeah. is that we can also talk to each other from thousands of miles away. So overall, it's a, it's a good thing. Why don't yeah. you tell us what it is? What have you been up to? What are you working on? Yeah, I am. So I'm currently the founder and CEO of Teach for Senegal, which is a uh, local organization that works on tackling educational inequity um, by recruiting young young leaders and having them commit to teaching in their own communities using indigenous knowledge and working alongside local community leaders. Um, I'm also a former teacher. I taught in the U.S. for three years uh, before moving back to my home country of, of Senegal. Okay, so were you born in Senegal? Yes, I was born in Senegal um, up until I was about uh, seven years old. Um, between the ages of seven and eight, I moved to the U.S. as a refugee, um, and that's where I did all my studies. I uh, Basically, I'm Senegalese-American. Um, okay. I know the U.S. more than I know Senegal, but my parents were very, very traditional Senegalese. So at what point in your education or in your time in the U.S., what point did you decide that this mission was something that you wanted to do? When people ask me that question, it's really difficult to answer because I think I've had like several instances in my life that have led to where I am today. I, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, you know, what would I be doing? I thought I would be like a lawyer somewhere in the U.N. making lots of money. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, God led me to this work and it's, and it's you know, something that I'm so grateful for. But, you know, I grew up with, first off, I think it really started off with just my upbringings. Uh, I grew up with a father who was very much like an advocate. Um, and we're, so we lived between the border of the Mauritania and Senegal, which is like in Northern Africa. Mm. Um, he was very much always protesting for the rights of indigenous black people. Um, and then I grew up with a mother who was also illiterate, um, but she was very book savvy, very uh, entrepreneurial, because she had to raise her kids when my father would get in trouble with the law because of protesting all this stuff. Mm. So she would always have to come up with like side businesses and kind of have to send, uh, make, you know, support my siblings and I. Yeah. And so growing up with, you know, with an illiterate mother and a father who is very much like a, a advocate uh, really helped with identity and culture so when I lived in the U.S. Uh, in Senegal, all the way until the age of seven, I actually never went to school. I didn't even know mm. that existed. Uh, the formal schooling, I guess, I didn't know that existed. It wasn't until I moved to the United States at the age of, you know, around the time I was eight when I started school in the U.S. And that was my first time entering like a school and learning how to read and write and, mm -hmm. you know, like actually understanding the concept of formal schooling. Um, I think that was the first for all of us. It was trying to navigate this life in the U.S., but also understanding, like, why is, like, and also realizing, like, why isn't this something that existed when, when we lived in Senegal? Mm. Um, and it was hard because I was just young myself trying to figure out what was happening, but my parents were relying on my siblings and I. Um, then, you know, I, I went to high school, college, all with this kind of having to support my family and having to, you know, uh, continuously translate. Um, and it wasn't really until college that this concept of like educational inequity really, uh, I started to really focus on that mm. because I would work, there was just seemed to be a, a repetitive issue when I would meet other refugees from other countries. Um, I volunteered a lot. And so I would always meet refugees who also were just like my mom, couldn't read and write and just are having a difficult time navigating the space. And the question of education equity, why does it exist and why is it that other people have access and some people don't? I really began to explore that during my senior year of, of, of college, um, during my undergrad. Um, this led me to India where I volunteered um, in what they call the slums of India and uh, just really the inequities were just in your face, the class difference. And, and that's where my, my, I, 
I was re- pursuing a degree in international relations, thinking that I could, you know, tackle education, tackle inequities and and uh, social justice issues by becoming a lawyer. But it was really in India, I realized if I want to change a system, a society, I have to start with the educational system first. Um, education is, is the base for all development, health, um, economic. And so um, that when I returned from India, I was recruited by Teach for America. And uh, I wanted to really understand the concept of teaching and the, the root causes of educational inequity. And so teaching really allowed me to see that uh, uh, even in the U.S., I taught in South Phoenix, which is considered, I guess, the ghetto hmm. of Phoenix. And it's where I grew up. So I just thought it was nice to, to, to teach kids in my own community. But yeah. I saw the importance of representation. Some of these students, there was the first time they ever had a black teacher. It was the first time they ever had someone that looked like them. Um, that understood really their struggles. And um, that was also where I learned like curriculums and who makes it and standards and these ways that we measure learning that are so backwards, so unrealistic. Um, and yeah, I, I guess that's where I got the model of Teach for, Teach for Senegal. Mm. I thought, you know, you know, I traveled back and forth to Senegal during my, my college years and my high school years. And it was always the same issue when I would travel like, Nobody was going to school. It was normal not to go to school. There, like my cousins, my my nobody was going to school. But I, um, you know, I didn't know how I could bring about change until I joined Teacher America, and the idea came to me. And after my two years, I decided to take the model of Teacher America and contextualize it to my context. Because it's always important to you know. To, to to contextualize and, and to look at the root causes of inequity in, in, in each country or each community. And so um, moved back in 2019 after receiving a, a stipend from Echoing Green, I had applied. I didn't know anything about entrepreneurship, but there was this uh, Echoing Green that was looking for, you know, young entrepreneurs who are, you know, out there trying to change the world. And I applied and I was so thankful to have gotten that grant and, and that allowed me to move and start Teach for Senegal um, and, and, and allowed me to really contextualize the model where we're looking at it far. We, like, it allowed me to see how deep educational equity is in Senegal. It's so colonial and it's so systematic. Um, and so we, our goal with our vision of Teach for Senegal is to really liberate Senegalese children and so that every every child in Senegal could be seen, loved and liberated and also have um, access to quality education that reflects them, an educational system they can see themselves in. And so with that, we recruit young people within our placement communities and we have them commit to teaching for two years. But it's more of how do we use indigenous knowledge? How do we use local languages? to really um, make, uh, enhance the learning of, of children. Because we are come from a colonial, uh, we're French colonized, um, and it's very much still a French system. Everything is done in French. Um, our literature is, is about France. And what is a young kid living in a remote village in Senegal learning about the Eiffel Tower or London, London, Versailles. Mary had a little lamb when right. they don't even know where Mary is. Um, and, right. and instead of them learning about things that are, are really there for their survival skills, because that's the purpose of education. It's, it's, it's survival. It's, it's, and it looks different from each country. And it, it, and it has to because each country is different in each community. And so uh, we don't use... We, we've designed our own model that reflects our communities and we really hope to um, one day that these kids can use their lo- own languages in, in the global arena, um, but also really be proud of where they come from and be able to understand their history and their culture. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did I answer your question? That does. <laughs> Time for a segment we like to call Ask the Streets. All right, so the topic of this week is education in communities around the world, poverty-stricken areas. 
What do you think is the most important thing about education globally? Well, it depends on the countries, but my country, Bangladesh, it was accessibility because we're in a flood-prone country. So during the monsoon season, kids cannot get to school. So nowadays we have school on the boat. So those boats go around the villages and conduct daily schools. So our education rate has gone up from the 60s all the way through 80s, it was like 30%. Now we're at almost 75% literacy rate. So what do you think the most important thing that kids need to learn in school or from the school system is? Basic education. What most is basic fundamental education? Fundamental education, being able to read and write and add, subtract, and understand the, uh, the global uh, impact we all leave behind. That's the most important thing in my point of view. Do you think entrepreneurship is an important skill for kids? Absolutely, and especially in the third world countries and developing countries in Bangladesh, India, and Africa, you'll find children that are 10 years old are self-employed, even though they're going to school, but they all have their own small businesses. Okay, great, thank you for your input, and we'll get back to the show. You're welcome. So at what age does your work begin currently for Teach for Senegal? So um, we, in terms of our, our fellows, we start, um, we don't have an age. It's more of like a, have your high school diploma plus two years of college. Um, and they currently teach uh, in the U.S. I guess it would be like kinder and first grade. Mm-hmm. Um, so be, the, the, the fact that we have such a young population for me, was crucial to add in a leadership development element to our program. Because if we, these are the people that are going to be leading Senegal in the next few years. So um, we have a conscious leadership element to our program where our fellows go through a lot of self-work, self-reflection, trauma, and what they consider leadership um, isn't necessarily what we, what you would consider good leadership. It's very much more of a dictatorship and Mm-hmm. I'm very mm-hmm. curious about that moment. You finished it. You said, this is something I can bring to Senegal. What was the very first step at that point? How did you start this? So I actually started Teach for Senegal. Be- I was working on Teach for Senegal before I finished Teach okay. for America. Um, right. I think it was my last year of Teach for America. I was just like, it just came to me. It was, I mean, I don't know how religious you are, but I really are spiritual. But I think that anything that you're supposed to do is already within you. Oftentimes we get these gut feelings or these thoughts or these visions. And it really came to me. I was just like one day sitting and I was like, why don't you just start Teach for Senegal? And it came and I was like, yeah, I messaged my director um, at Teach for America Phoenix. She was really good. uh, Her and I were pretty close. And I text her. I was just like, so I want to start Teach for Senegal. Can you help me? <laughs> and she was just like, yeah, this is great. I will help you in any way. Let me go ahead. Did you know that they actually have a global network? I was like, what global network? And she was like, there's a global network called Teach for All, where entrepreneurs from other countries who also like the model are, are have started it. You know, there's Teach for India now. There's Teach for Ghana. And they've all come together and created a global network with Wendy, who is the the, the founder of Teach for America, and there is a global network called Teach for All. I, she connected me with them. I started working with them and started to meet other CEOs from other countries who are also doing the same thing, who are on the same path as me, or who were on the same path as me. And, and that's kind of how the journey began. You know, I started to talk to Teach for Haiti CEO, Teach for Ghana, and, you know, Armenia. And I was, you know, and then one thing left to another, and here I am. <laughs> well, first of all, how many children are you able to, or, or people are you able to impact in a year, would you estimate? Do you know? So this year, we recruited 20 who are impacting about 3,000 students directly and about 5,000 indirectly. So, um, yeah, teachers are, 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 they, you know, they, they're one of a kind. They're everything for the community. And so, uh Every year, I think we're about, and hope, next year we hope to have 
uh, double the amount of fellows, which will double the amount of impact we'll have on us. Um, and we're working across about 10 communities currently. Um, so we're very, very grateful. If everything went swimmingly, everything went absolutely perfectly in the next five years, where would you be five years from now? If everything went perfectly, perfectly. Teach for Senegal would not exist. Ooh. That Whoa. Yeah, if everything went perfectly well, I would hope that Teach for Senegal would longer exist, would, is no longer needed because all, ch- all children in Senegal would have access to an excellent education that nurtures their, their whole being. So I genuinely don't want Teach for Senegal to be 50, 25 years from now, because that means that whatever I'm doing is not working. Um, and, and my goal is to not perpetuate a system, but to really tackle the inequities that exist. So, yeah, I know that's not a, an answer that a lot of people would. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Are you teaching entrepreneurship as well? Is that a part of your curriculum? Yeah, for our fellows, um, the leaders, so the idea of like teaching and developing their leadership includes entrepreneurship because after the two years, you know, we'll have some fellows that want to be entrepreneurs, we'll have some fellows that want to continue teaching. So during the second year, we really focus on um, getting in experts in terms of, you know, how do you write a constant note? How do you begin to really, you know, how do you budget? All of that stuff we, we want, we'll introduce to our fellows. Um, yeah, because a lot of our, our fellows are not sure entrepreneurs, but they just lack the resources and the skills, um, simple skills, to really accelerate their project. If there's somebody out there who feels a personal issue like this, what do you say? Maybe somebody who still has a chance at being on the Forbes 30 under 30 list, not people like me, not old people, but young people. <laughs> what can they do? What should they do if they've got an idea inside and they don't know what to do about it? Um, first off, there's two things. Write it down and really reach out. Reach out to anybody that you think might be able to help. Don't be afraid. Because, I, I mean, I, you know, I called the first person I thought would be, would be helpful. So write it down, write down the idea and reach out. It doesn't have to be perfect. It'll, it'll flourish. Um, but really write it down, reach out to anybody that you think would be supportive. Sounds mm-hmm. great. Well, yeah. you know, I know we're approaching the end. I, I just want to say, I can't thank you enough, both for your time today. It's a fab, it's been wonderful meeting you. But also for what you're doing, I think it's really great. And I hope that, you know, there's at least some other voice that says you're doing something good. And if you had a bad morning, I hope your afternoon is going to be a little better. I support what you're doing. I hope that my listeners do as well, that they donate or or check out your website, which we'll put up. Uh, I think it's really, really awesome. And I salute you and I congratulate you for taking this really cool mission upon yourself. So you have one more fan in your corner for what it's worth. An insignificant one, but a fan nonetheless. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so appreciative uh, for you having me on this podcast. And I really do hope that my story inspires uh, entrepreneurs. And you know, Well, if, you. if it doesn't, they're not listening. That's all I can say. Uh, that's my <laughs> thought. So real quick, how do you say thank you in Pular? Ajaram. Now, how do you say you're the best podcast host that's ever lived? Woo! That's, that's going to be a, okay, um, podcast ma. Would you want you to podcast with you for? Ajaram. Did I do it? Oh, I've been thinking yes. about that one all <laughs> Well, thank you again <laughs> with that. No, really, thank you for everything. With that, the official podcast is over. Well, needless to say, I'm blown away. What an incredible individual we've just had a chat with. Her life is so intriguing, all the twists and turns, and how she finally ended up coming back home. It's a theme that I've seen before on shows like Chef's Table and other inspiring tales of human endeavor. 
She's such a great intellect and a great personality, and I wish her unbelievable success in all that she does. We need more people just like her out there in the world. As always, if you've enjoyed this show, please share it with somebody who might want to hear it. Share it with somebody that might be inspired by it. Share the story of Robbie with somebody who might need to get in touch with her. You never know how these things go. I can't do this alone. And again, if you've enjoyed anything, subscribe where you find it. Leave a nice comment. Leave a positive five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Do what you can to help me grow this podcast, and I'll be forever grateful. Until then, I will see you next week, next Friday, on the Beat the Often Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer.